So I'm going to record a video series that's uh, using some slides I've been preparing for a class I'm teaching this semester um, in fall 2021. Um, so this is a class intended for students with a background in policy or a related background. Um, so people who maybe don't have experience with computer science or stati statistics or any of the typical backgrounds associated with people who have studied machine learning. So what the, the advantage is that I've been trying to build educational materials that um, are accessible to people without the same, you know, those, those very technical backgrounds. Maybe I've never written a computer program. Um, and I think there's a lot of people interested in this kind of stuff. So I'm hoping that uh, there's an audience of interested folks that maybe like you, maybe you're watching this um, and you have, want to learn something about machine learning. So it'll, it'll be a series. I've been talking th through various topics through the semester and, and we'll, you know, we'll begin with this first one. So this is a bird's eye view of neural networks. So to begin with, we're talking about machine learning neural networks, but it's important to think back to, you know, what are these things named after, right? So a, a biological neural network is, you know, what makes us all think and what makes us all uh, you know, able to process the world and make decisions um, is a collection of neurons, right? Our brains, and you know, if you also include, you know, nerves that are that act, uh, you know, throughout our body. Th these are these are uh, you know, biological units, you know, they're cells that 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 essentially send messages to each other. And now, you know, are they really sending messages to each other? Like, if we get into the actual details about it, there's you know, there's chemical and electrical si uh, signals. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated than kind of a, I want to call it like a simplified model, but a simplified model is the idea that it's a network, like a computer network where there's connections. You have, uh, you know, neurons and they're connected to each other in some complex pattern. And when a neuron is excited, it, you know, it's or activated as it's, as it's called, uh, it will send lots of electrical signals out to all of the, the, the other neurons that it's connected to. And then the, those other neurons will receive those signals and then decide whether they want to get activated. And so you have this kind of cascading effect um, across the network. And, and then the complexity of this, the network allows, you know, amazing things to happen, like us being able to you know, use language or, or process uh, visual input. Um, you know, everything that, we, that are, is in our lives is because th these neural networks have found a way to represent the world to us in a way that we can, you know, understand and talk about and and be in this society together with with each other. So com computer neural networks are just sort of, com you know, computer mathematical models that are inspired by this idea. So we'll talk about that now. So the plan is we're going to I'm going to go over linear models, um, which are essentially the simplest form of neural network. And then we'll get into more complicated neural networks. And there's a lot of jargon here. There's a lot of like terminology that doesn't necessarily mean what it sounds like. So uh, I'm going to try to explain all those along the way. And in particular, like this, you know, the second topic is I want to, I want to explain why there are, why are these weird names for these things? Like why is it called deep learning? Why is it sometimes called representation learning? Why is it sometimes called end to end, end to end learning? And I, I'm hoping to give you the intuition behind, you know, why these names come up and what, you know, what do they have to do with neural networks? So we'll talk about that. Uh, then we'll go into the basics of neural, computer, uh, neural computer vision models. So, so this is a, a hugely popular, uh, hugely successful application of neural networks where we've done some pretty amazing things in the recent years in advancing the capability of computers to understand visual input. Um, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through the, the, uh, the basic idea about how neural networks are able to accomplish this task. Uh, then we'll talk about neural language models, which is another area where we've done some amazing, had some amazing progress in recent years using neural networks when other methods didn't, um, you know, weren't, maybe weren't as successful. Then I want to close with some discussion questions that are, you know, just things for you to think about that maybe will help you, you know, put the, um, the different concepts I'm talking about here together in your mind. And feel free to, you know, this is going to be posted on YouTube, so feel free to comment your answers and discuss with other uh, viewers if you want. So let's talk about linear models. As an example, consider the uh, a situation where you know you have a, or you're trying to build an app 
that will take in some information about a user. So we'll call these, these in the input features. We'll take some information about a user and try to predict or, or recommend a daily calorie intake, right? So you, you, uh, in the US, the uh, FDA recommends 2,000 know, 2, calories per day for the average person. Right, but you know, nobody is average, so you can you can put in other information. And this this app will hopefully give you a um, you know a number that's that's better suited for your health. So a linear model for this looks like looks like this equation. And so this, I, I, I'm sorry that, that you know this is this is some math. Uh, I don't want to show too much math in this video series, um, but this math is just you know it's relatively simple. It's like there's these there's these numbers like 0.115. And it's multiplied by the age, the age value, and so age is a variable. Uh, sorry, I say this is an equation. This is this is also it's also equivalent to uh, in many programming languages to code. Um, but anyway, so so the the right the age is a variable. So that number could be like you know maybe it's a teenager, so fifteen, or maybe it's a, a middle aged person, so fifty five or something like that. Right, it's a number. Uh, height is also a number. Let's just assume it uses some some units. Let's say let's say it uses um, you know centimeters or inches or whatever. It actually doesn't matter for this example. Um, uh, so so th those 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 value the the words that I put in bold are variables, and those are numbers that are that are you know, that represent the person. They represent the person, the user using the app. Um, and the idea is that this this model, you know, as much as you can call it a model, just multiplies those values by some score, some, uh, not, sorry, not score, some weight. Uh, and so these are called weights. And and uh, and then outputs the, the, the sum of all those values. So that is, that is a linear model. That's the whole thing. Um, and this is technically a neural network, but what makes it special is that, you know, in, in neural networks, or when you're using a neural network, you're going to try to adjust those weights to make this model better and better. So the score here is a weighted sum. And it's worth thinking about, like, given this model, uh, or give, right, given this form of linear model, what are the possible values we can get for score? And, you know, to think about that, you want to think about what are the possible values for these variables. And it, it just turns out that the, I, I just chose this, I made up this example, but in this example, all the variables are going to be positive values, right? No one can have, you know, age of zero. Well, you, you can't have an age of zero if, unless you're unless you're born in the second, um, and uh, and you can't have a height of zero because you have to exist, right? And so, and the heart rate of well, I guess you can have a heart rate of zero uh, and blood pressure of zero. So technically, you can do that, but you probably don't want to use the app if you're in that situation. Um, okay. Anyway, so 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 those are going to be positive values, and all the weights happen to also be positive. So what that tells us is that the range of values is going to be some, you know, all positive values. And you can probably also say like, okay, age is not going to be more than, you know, 150. You know, if we're optimistic about how medical science will improve over the years, um, height will probably won't be more than I mean, uh, like, I don't know, 10 feet. Um, maybe is the is probably bigger than any human will ever. Be. I don't, I'm actually not sure about that, but um, anyway, you can come up with like maximum numbers here, and so you can figure out like the, the maximum value as well. But it's worth thinking about that. So sometimes in uh, right, if those numbers uh, are the, that aligns with what we want, right? We want the range of numbers to be things that could be recommended calorie values, and those are positive values. So that makes sense. But in other cases, sometimes you want to build a neural network that outputs a yes or no answer or a probability. And you can do things by you can you can transform these values to make them, you know, to take them from the range of all possible value possible possible positive values to the range of maybe all uh, zero or one uh, numbers between zero and one, or which would be a probability. Um, and you can also think, you know, what can you do to transform a score, a, you know, a number, a score to a yes or no number, a yes or no like discrete response. And one way you can do that is to threshold it, right? You, you just pick a value as the, the boundary between yes and no. And if it's below that boundary, you say no. If it's above the boundary, you say yes. So anyway, so this is a linear model. And the most important thing is that, that we're not, you know, this is, we're not just going to throw this, these numbers into the app and just use it. We're going to try to learn. So we're going to learn from data. So the goal in learning, the goal when we do machine learning is to, we want to train a model that succeeds at a task in general. Right? And I'm bold in general because that's an important point. Um, we can't ever do this because we don't see everything in the world. 
Instead, what we see is we get a consolation, pro consolation prize, which is that we train a model that succeeds on a task on training data. So we have some set of data. We, we've collected some data. We've, 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 you know, we've run some surveys or we asked people for you know, their information. Um, however, we collected the data. Um, maybe it's a lot of data and the, the, and then we can train a model to do well on that training data, but we can never precisely know that this model will work well on new data, on, on new examples. So that's a major challenge in, in machine learning. And uh, you know the general rule is, is much like in human learning, like if you have a lot of examples and you do, you do well on all those examples, you can feel pretty confident it'll do well on, on real data. But there's some, there's some tricky situations there that we have to be careful about. But anyway, well, that's not the topic of today's video. So the training procedure is we basically take the weights from that linear model, we try them on the training data, and then we measure the quality of the outputs. Right? And I, I say this very vaguely because there's lots of ways you can measure the quality of the outputs. Um, and then once you measure the quality of the outputs, you adjust the weights to improve the quality. Right? You improve that quality by, by you know, tweaking the, weight, the weights. And you repeat this until you're satisfied with, how, with the quality that you're getting. And the way you uh, the way you adjust the weights is often using calculus. So we won't get into it, but basically, if you you know, some, many of you probably have taken calculus, uh, so you might remember derivatives. So we use derivatives a lot, which tells us how things you know how functions change. So, but we won't get into that. Uh, the point is that we're gonna we're gonna use some strategy to adjust the weights. So to go with that example, suppose we have an uh, a person, uh, you know, a user of the app who's a twenty year old. They're uh, five feet, four inches tall, 120 pounds. Sorry for using imperial uh, units. I am an American. Um, but, and the, the doctor rec recommends 2,000 calories. So the doctor suggests that this is a, um, uh, you know, this is, this is an average person according to like what the, the FDA has decided. And so um, this person should get 200 calories each day. So the way we do this is we, we put it into the model and I, and I simplified the model. I removed some of the other, I moved the blood, blood pressure and the other, I think I forget what the other feature was. Uh, so, so you put these numbers in and you get, get out the score 80, right? 80 is our new score or 80 is the, the current score with the current weights, right? We just multiplied, you know, 0.155 by 20, added that to 0.481 you know, by uh, whatever 54 is in inches. Um, and so on, and 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 I, you know, I did it. I did it else, you know, in my notes elsewhere. So I don't remember. Um, I think it, I think this is correct. It doesn't actually matter, so, but but it, you, it's something around eighty. Um, so now the the problem is that that's not good, right? We wanted two thousand. So just just intuitively, if we look at the weights ourselves as humans, we can say, okay, well, these weights are obviously too small. So let's make them bigger. So I just randomly made them bigger and then tried to tried these out, and I got this number. So I, I made the weights all bigger. Um, I didn't really do it very intelligently. I just said, let's just throw in some random numbers that are bigger than the numbers I had before. And I, now I got, you know, uh, 1500 or 1574. And so it's a, cl it's closer, but it's still too small, right? So again, let's make them bigger again. Let's just take all the numbers and make them bigger. Um, and now, uh, now we get a score of 2593, which is too big. So if this were to continue, we would then want to shrink the weights, right? The point is that I, I previously tried to increase the weights and it made it it made the score too high um and so now we want to shrink the weights back down and and again we're, you know using calculus you can do this a little bit more intelligently like you're not just going to randomly increase the weights in a, in a computer although that there are some algorithms that do that um okay so so that's the idea of training and and that's how a linear model works and so, so, you know, how is that a neural network? Well, the way that we think of that as a neural network is that we think of all those input features, like the age, the height, the weight, those are all neurons, right? Those, the neurons will get excited if the age is big, or the neurons will get excited if the person's really tall, right? Those are neur neurons. And then those are connected to the score, the score neuron, a score neuron. Um, and, and the idea is then, you know, we try to, learn how strong those connections should be between those neurons to make that score neuron give us a good score. Um, but that's pretty unrealistic that we would have just, you know, direct connections from the, the observations to the, the target value. So, so instead, 
Um, well, another thing, uh, so what makes like neural networks, like, uh, sorry, the, that was a neural network, but what makes more compl complicated neural networks interesting is that they essentially, essentially take this idea and stack it a bunch of times or, or run, you know, build multiple linear models that all collect together. Um, so for example, if you had the, you know, I'm drawing here on the screen, I'm trying to represent that, suppose this is the linear model I just showed you, right? So it takes in these five features, it multiplies by some, some numbers and then adds them up and you get some calorie estimate. You might have another neural network that takes in the same information and outputs how much exercise a person should get, right? And, and, and then you might have yet another neural network that outputs, um, you know, a, an estimate of someone's, someone's economic status, which might give you some uh, bad feelings because that's starting to get into some potentially ethically dangerous uh, usage of people's data. But anyways, just, you can just imagine if someone builds a tool like, like this. So, so all these things are, are numbers that were output um, you know, from little neural networks. And then you can also then take these things and pass them into another neural network, right? another linear model. So you can pass them in and say, look, maybe some, uh, uh, that last neural network or that last linear model will estimate someone's life, expect life expectancy based on their calories, exercise, and economic status as output by the previous neural network. So the, the principle here is that like all these are just numbers, right? These are just all variables. And so you can, you can have the output become the input to another layer. And we also like to you know, generalize this. So we don't want to, you know, I was giving an example with very specific variables, but normally we just think of these as, you know, there's just variables. There's X1 through X5 and there's H, H are, we often write H to mean hidden. This is a hidden variable. Um, because a lot of times, usually what you have is just the input and the output. So I just, I just show this just to, sh just to remind you that, you know, we're not only building neural networks that can handle these particular variables or this particular use case. This is a general concept that can be applied to other applications, other tasks. So at a high level, this is like what, you know, how people will often draw neural networks. Maybe it's not the best drawing in the world, but the, the idea is that like you start on the left and on the left, you have raw data input. That's like whatever, um, you know, whatever is the input to the problem you're trying to solve. And then on the out, on the right is the, uh, is the output is, you know, whatever you want the, you know, the smart, uh, application to, to provide you after you give it the input. And all the stuff in the middle is a bunch of little neural networks, essentially. So you, you sort of you sort of pass through, you know, you pass the raw data input into the neural network, and you get some other output, and then that output gets passed into another neural network, and you get a, yet another output. And these are all they are all, all often, you know, they're called hidden layers. I don't know how important it is for you to know what they're called, but they're they're hidden layers because they're called hidden layers because we don't really we, we don't really think of ourselves as being able to look at these. We don't really care in, in a sense we don't really care about what values are in there all we care about is the relationship between the input and the output right as users of a neural network we just care about like if we pass in you know this person's information what estimate of calories does it output so this will give rise to the the uh the different names so for for deep learning uh a lot of people have heard of deep learning in fact it's become such a bit common word it's hard to, you know, when people use it, use that phrase, it's not clear if they are using it too broadly, but an, it, but it, it was originally designed as a, as a term to describe methods like neural networks where, um, where we learn the parts of the model all the way from the, the, begin, the raw input to the, the final output and that there's lots of stages in between that were like lots of stages that were all doing that were doing learning on all of it at the same time so it's it's that we can imagine that as a, it's a deep learning process as in it's you know it's, it's it's going many layers deep it's also just a brilliant marketing term uh, you know that that sounds you know very uh, evocative right but but it, but it is based on some you know actual description of what's happening mathematically um, another name for this type of stuff is representation learning, which is similar in, the, in that one of the key ideas about this is that those middle layers are representations of the data. Uh, and, and you're essentially trying to learn them. And then the last thing that people talk about is end-to-end -end learning. And this is, this is where there's a contrast between 
sort of the the way of people thought about these problems before deep learning and before neural networks kind of well before deep learning became popular um, in recent years uh, which is that we used to people used to kind of take the raw input and design and try to think about it and try to imagine how to process it into a more useful representation um, and and then they would do that and then they would learn uh, they will learn from that new that the engineered uh, useful representation to the uh, how to produce the final output. Well, what end-to-end -end learning does is it just says, you know, no, let's just do learning for everything, all the way from the beginning, from the raw input all the way to the output. We'll learn all of it at once. So then it's useful to think about how these neural networks have been applied to computer vision. And I'll, I'll talk about, I guess, one of the more popular uses of computer vision, which is uh, image classification. And so I, I've just drawn some cartoons using some clip art. Um, so imagine you get as input a picture of a tree and, and you like we as humans look at it and we're like, yeah, this is a tree. Um, and uh, and then a computer might look at it and and be like, okay, well, this is a bunch of pixels. I don't know what this is. Um, so so a, what we want is a computer that can look at it and make the same determination we make, which is like, what is the object in the picture? So is this a tree? And I, I'll just flip forward in the next slide. I have a picture of a fire truck, uh, again, clip art from Apple Keynote. Um, but the the uh, the idea is that well, you know, can we tell the difference between these things? Right? Can the computer tell the difference between, difference between these things? And and the way that, that uh, these neural vision models work, or these these new well, they're not that new, but the, uh, the the more the models that have been shown recently to be very effective um, is they. They create spatial representations of the image, right? So you start with the the raw input, which is a bunch of pixels, right? So to a computer, it's just like a list of numbers. It doesn't really understand that there's a shapes in this at all. Um, but we, they, it does understand that the pixels are meant to be laid out in a grid, right? So when you think about like a digital camera, you talk about how many megapixels it has. Um, people often talk about the resolution, like um, uh, you know, 1080p is the res resolution, and you have a certain number of pixels along the along the top and a certain number of pixels along the bottom, uh, along the, 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 the right edge or at either edge. Uh, so, so we know that pixels are laid out in a grid. And so what these neural computer vision models do is they, they have little neural networks that run along the image and they, they make some, you know, produce some new output based on whatever they see in, in that region of the image. So what I'm trying to draw here in this picture is that, you know, the little red box on the left is like, uh, that's, that's what the neural network is looking at. And the neural network looking at that is outputting the edges of, um, of the image. So it's trying to identify where are the edges in the, in this picture. Um, and, and, you know, uh, from our perspective as a human, we know what that is. An edge is something like uh, where, where one, an object begins or an object ends and another object begins. So that little neural network is just producing edges. It's just it's just scanning over the image and finding where are the edges. Uh, another another neural network that I'm, draw, that I'm drawing on the right might look scan over the image and look for something like sharp angles, right? So it finds sharp angles where the, the branches are in the tree. Um, and yeah, what I'm illustrating on the right is like like those are the those are the pixels that are output by each of these little neural, little, little neural networks. And you know, where it's, where it's a black pixel, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it activated and where it's a white pixel, it didn't activate. So the, I think the key innovation here, or I, maybe this innovation is the wrong word, the, the key design uh, uh, brilliance here is that like all these, all these outputs of the neural networks are also images. They're also re rectangles, right? Rectangles of, Maybe not pixels. Maybe pixels is the wrong word, but they're rectangles of values that are aligned in the same way that pixels are, right? They're they're arranged in a rectangle the same way. So this is an example of you know this would maybe what the edge detector looks like and, and the sharp angle detector looks like for the the uh, the fire truck picture. So conceptually, the con these con these things called convolutional neural networks, what they do is they start with the raw rep representation of pixels and maybe then. It would do something like, like this is this is just like a uh, an example, but like maybe what it would do is the first phase it has a little neural network network that scans over the image and I finds all the edges, and the second phase is it, it another another neural network scans over all the different edge values, right from the previous layer, uh, and identifies where the textures are, 
And then another layer might you do scan over the image and find where all the different shapes are. And then you might find you know parts of objects and then you find objects and you get to a category, right? That's like conceptually how this might work, right? It's essentially like a pipeline of processing from the raw pixels into more and more useful representations. And, you know, of course these are hidden layers so we don't really know what they do. We just care about training the model to, do, to go from pixels to the target task, which is a category. So that, the, the, I think the main takeaway from these about these convolutional neural networks is that they, they try to build representations of the image that are also kind of images, right? They're also basically like rectangles of pixels. So it gets away from the fact that, you know, normally when a computer gets a bunch of numbers, it just thinks there's a bunch of numbers and it doesn't know what they are. In this case, we're explicitly telling the computer to remember that these are numbers arranged in a grid, in a grid the way that, in, that an image is. Okay, so we'll talk again at the high level about neural language models. So these have been really gaining in power in recent years. And there's a few examples that you might have heard of. There's, there's BERT, which has nothing to do with me. Um, it causes a lot of confusion because you know, I research machine learning and this is a machine learning model, but whatever. It's, okay, it's, it has nothing to do with me, um, but, it's, uh, but it stands, you know, it stands for something. Which it's not important what it is, but Bert comes from Google. Uh, from Google researchers, produced a, uh, a you know this open source tool that that is a, is a neural language model. Uh, OpenAI produced GPT two and GPT three, and before that, word to vec is another sort of famous language model. Although I'm not sure that people would call it a language model, but I think technically it is. If I, but I would based on my definition. But anyway, um, so. The, again, a neural network, sorry, a neural language model is a neural network, and it's it's another one of these things where it takes in raw input and it processes that raw input into some more and more useful representation. And um, and then if, and then it finally goes to some final output, right, which is which is trained to do better and better on some particular task. And what's so clever about neural language models is that they uh, the task that these particular language models uh, try to train these neural networks to do is this idea of like fill in the blanks, right? So you get, you have examples of language and you just, you can just hide one of the words and ask the language model to, um, to figure out what that word is, to try to predict what that word is or try to guess what the word is, All right? So if you look at the sentence, I borrowed books from the blank, um, you know, probably, you know, mo I don't, I can't, it's hard, it's hard to imagine, you know, other words than library there. So, like, because we understand the concept of what a library is, because we understand what the concept of what a book is, we can read this and we can guess that library belongs there. Um, so, if you know, if the neural neural language model is able, is good at this task, then we can we can kind of interpret that it has learned what the meanings of these words are. Um, and more uh, also interestingly, like uh, in the second example, like my blank is my grandfather's child. Um, there's multiple words that could fit in there. And what's cool about neural language models is that th they essentially have to learn that all those words that could fit in there, right? What is this grandfather's child? So it could be, you know, mother, it could be aunt, uncle, uh, it could be father. Um, I, I might be forgetting some, but, but yeah, you could be nicknames for these, right? Like uh, mama, papa, uh, unk, whatever. So um, it, like all these are, are equivalent, right? That all these me all these words have similar meaning meanings, and this task will 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 force the neural language model to try to get good at that, try to understand the that these words are are interchangeable or that certain words belong in certain places. And the other really clever thing about this is that you don't. You don't have to go and label data. Right? You can, if you have a lot of text, you can just create these examples without someone someone sitting there and actually answering this. Right? If, if we had to go and answer, this would be really costly. But um, you know, one of the big things you need in machine learning is a lot of data, and and with this task, you can just get all you have to do is read text, and you can just generate this data. So once you train this neural language model, you can then take the the first part of the model. Everything that you've, you know, that that process the data into some representation that is finally at the end used to predict a miss, a missing word, and you can we can hypothesize that that output from this middle layer, the last middle layer, we, the output has some representation that is meaningful, that is semantically meaningful, and so the intuition, right, is that is that there's some meaning encoded in the output there, 
And then you can just take that and use that to build other applications. So the language model recipe is this, is this concept of, that's also called transfer learning, um, where you take a large neural network and you train it to solve a task, you know, like missing word prediction, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be some other task. So you train it to solve some task and you, and you design the task so that the only way that it can be solved is by understanding the language. Then you can use the learned representation as numerical features for text. You essentially use it to convert text, which is a very complex idea, into some numbers that can just be used in some neural network. And then usually what you do is you take some small model uh, for, for your desired task and you train it to you know, solve it using those numerical features. So that's the idea behind these very powerful language models. So I'll leave you with a few questions. So the first question I, I wanna ask you is, so how can we use a learned representation for vision models, right? I talked about how we use the learned re representation for, um, for language models, but how can we do it for vision? Like suppose we train a face detector, right? And now we wanna train a pedestrian tracker for a self-driving car. Can we take same, the principles that we've seen previously in, you know, in the language model case um, and apply that to here? Another question I want to ask is, you know, what hidden features might neural language models be learning to represent language? Like, what are these numerical values that are coming out of uh, these language models? It's pretty tricky, right? But but it's it's I think it's a useful exercise to think about this because it helps you think about like, you know, what what are we doing when we read text and process it and you know somehow turn it into activation values of our neurons? I mean, that's a hugely complex question, but that's a, maybe a more complicated version of what these neural, these computer neural networks are doing. Uh, so another question, I kind of already answered it, but uh, how, how do we convert a numerical score to a yes or no answer or to a probability? So I, I, I mentioned that it's possible to do, I actually said the answer to, to the yes or no question, but how about to a probability? And finally, I'll just give you one more question. Um, if, you, if we can only train a neural network to succeed with training data, right, how do we know it will do well on the real task? Right, this, is, this gets to the first point I brought up, right? So, so we want a computer program that can do well on some task in general, but we can train it, we can only train it to do well on the data we have. And it's not useful to just like solve the data we have, right? It's not useful because because we are, we could just look it up, right? If we, if we have already recorded, you know, the the a doctor's recommendation for a person's eat daily calorie intake, um, for for you know for me, right? For Bert, uh, Bert Huang, the speaker here, not the not the neural language model. Um, if we've already recorded, you know, we already know what the doctor recommended, then we don't have to build a neural network to like tell me that thing that we just wrote down. Like we just we have it written down somewhere, so we can just use that. So the, the challenge is then what happens if you, you know, pass in or you, if you want to do this for someone who's never, whose data has never been recorded. And how do we have any assurance that what we learn will do well on, um, on new data? And there are techniques for, for trying to get to this. So, so it's worth, I mean, you know, I could just tell you, but I want you to think about it. Okay, so I guess that's it. It's kind of, um, it's kind of a lot. But the, the, the main idea is that, you know, neural networks are like big, big jumbled combinations of lots of linear models, right? You can, and I started with the idea of the biological neural network, and you can think of that as a linear model because the, essentially the weight between, uh, you know, one neuron and another neuron is like how closely connected are they? And I talked about why it's called deep learning, representation learn, learning, end-to-end -end learning. You know, why it's somewhat useful to learn about these jargon terms, or at least have some understanding of what they, or why they're named as they are. And then I, I went over the basics of neural computer, uh, neural computer vision models and neural language models. And of course, these are much more complex than I showed. And even what I showed is probably, well, it, it certainly oversimplifies things. So I hope that's that's helpful to. You know, get get an idea of how these very popular, very very powerful models are working. So yeah, feel free to answer the questions and comments below if you want. Um, and uh, you know, I'll try.
try to respond as much as I can. And stay tuned, I'll record some more of these. I, I've been doing this for the class, like I said, I've been doing this for the class I'm teaching, and so I, it's kind of fun for me to put some stuff on the internet and get some feedback from you all.